Exactly. Down in the Waikato, a fleet of five buses was ferrying delegates around three different properties to learn firsthand about our sustainable farming techniques. This is one among a number of Dairy NZ research farms, and at this first stop, the group heard firsthand about milk yields from pasture. We have two and a half cows per hectare. We're aiming for a thousand, we call it a thousand kilograms of milk solids per hectare. You might call it around 12,000 litres per hectare. And we know from previous measurements that that uh, level of farming intensity, the nitrogen loss to our, our uh, waterways is around about 20 kilos per hectare or 20 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of milk solids. Then a short walk along the way and next to some effluent ponds, our visitors were given the ins and outs of effluent disposal, a tricky topic not only in their homelands, but sometimes here in New Zealand. The whole idea of this is about trying to apply it to the land so it stays in the root zone. So we're capturing the nutrient value and therefore the economic value of that effluent because it is a resource. New Zealand with its wholly grass-based dairy industry is a world leader in pasture management. Delegates heard about mixes of varieties such as chicory and plantain with the more conventional clover and ryegrass and what they mean for the cow. If we have pastures which are made up of a whole mixture of species, is that going to provide the cows any better with the sort of things that they need? And are those pastures going to produce more dry matter? So are they going to grow better? And are they going to survive better? And also what effect are they going to have on the cows in terms of where the cows partition their nitrogen to. And the final instalment on this farm, a Waikato University project to measure carbon and how the soil stores it. These instruments measure the movement of CO2 and its concentration 20 times a second, with the welter of data transmitted back to the university for analysis. So when you bring those two numbers together, how fast the air is moving and which direction it's moving, with the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, you know the amount of CO2 that is going down or is going up. And then you add that up over an hour, a day, a week, a season, a year, and you get the overall carbon balance for that system over that time. Meanwhile, back at the conference, delegates were only too happy to talk to Sector Report about dairying in their home countries and their perceptions of New Zealand's vital and highly successful dairy industry. The main difference would be that as in Chile we were net importers uh, until 2000, uh, the industry uh, incentivated farmers to have a flat calding and flat production and going very much into the system very similar to New Zealand. In so, fact the genetics we use both in animals and cows and in grass are New Zealand genetics. Many elements we use like uh, electric fences etc come from New Zealand so it's quite similar. There in Brazil it's developed. In Brazil it's now uh, the sixth production in the world. They produce more, more milk than New Zealand but this just for the, the marketing, for, for Brazil, you don't export milk like uh, New Zealand. What would be the main difference in the industry between the way we do it here and Brazil does it? Yeah, <laughs> It's completely different because Brazil, there is, mm, we start, we produce a lot of milk but we have no technology. We start to develop our industry now and our production, it, it's completely different than New Zealand because here it's the best country. Then we have a lot to learn with the New Zealand for produce milk in Brazil. What makes you so special is that you are the only country that is exporting such an amount, such a large percentage of your production. When you look, for example, in the US, 92, 93% is locally consumed. EU, 91% is locally consumed. Canada, 100% is locally consumed. India, 100% is locally consumed. Uh, but it's only New Zealand, 80% export, and uh, Australia, 50% export. That are really exporting countries. Even when you have a low production, 
40 million, uh, 40 billion liters, comparable to compared to 500 billion in Europe. But as you're exporting such a large percentage, you are a main player on the world market. And that is, I think, what makes New Zealand dairy different from most of the others. Welcome back. Next, I talk to Case Tahart, the man who runs the Fonterra of the Netherlands, Friesland Campina. They're keen competitors for the New Zealand Co-op, but they're also our customers. Well, Case, welcome to the Sector Report program here on Country 99 TV, and welcome indeed to New Zealand. Now, you've called your company the Fonterra of the Netherlands, so you're obviously big, but how big in comparison to our Co-op? Well, we are a bit bigger, it depends a bit on uh, the exchange rate, mm. uh, but we are uh, uh, almost 9 billion uh, euro company. Mm. We are in uh, more than 25 countries, uh, represented with marketing, sales and, uh, and operations. Mm. We are uh, doing businesses uh, in, uh, let's say, over 100 uh, countries, nice. uh, with 20,000 uh, people around the world, mm. so at least we have an uh, imprint. Yeah. Um, it's based on uh, the merger of uh, Friesland uh, Foods and Campina. Mm -hmm. which uh, was realized uh, almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then, uh, we are Friesland Campina. Right. Well, I should say Royal Friesland Campina. So are you competitors? Well, it's, it's um, um, a nice relationship, or a strange relationship, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. We are, indeed, we are competitors, um, but uh, we are partners as well in the GDP. Uh, and basically, uh, we are customers from Fontara because we su they supply quite a lot of... Uh, uh, products to us, uh, especially uh, uh, for our operations in Asia. At the conference you've talked about quotas for dairy production in the EU. Are these quotas liked or, or loathed by Dutch farmers? Well, it depends on um, um, who, who you talk. And uh, I think when, when you talk to 50,000 uh, farmers in the Netherlands, there are the, uh, she different uh, opinions about it. Mm. Uh, but basically, I think it gives a, a level of uh, regulation so far. So people, farmers, uh, are used to it. Um, but frankly, some of them, uh, or most, I guess most of them, are keen um, that they are uh, uh, elevated mm. uh, and uh, that they are abolished by 2015. And that means that they are free to, uh, uh, to produce what they want. Right. So is, is that definitely going to happen in That's 2015? That's definitely going to happen, yeah. Right. Even the new commissioner uh, of, uh, of Europe, mm. uh, which basically was just appointed a few months ago, said that he would uh, see this through, yes. Mm. There's also the question of farmer subsidies. Of course, we now have no such thing in New Zealand, but how does it rate as an issue for European farmers? I think it's important for them uh, that they get that kind of uh, support. The, 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 the cost of uh, uh, producing is uh, relatively high compared to uh, New Zealand. Um, and I know that, uh, uh, let's say, the Euro Com European Commission is reviewing this, uh, but probably the subsidies are about to, uh, to stay. Um, the question is in what kind of format or yeah. way they will do that. What change do you see happening in the, in the form of those subsidies? That's difficult to say at this moment of time, uh, but it might be uh, that there will be some changes, uh, uh, especially at the moment that uh, the quota will be abolished. But the question is what kind of format uh, uh, the, 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 the support will be uh, uh, sustained. Well, what's your view on developments and markets for dairy produce internationally? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively new to, uh, to dairy, mm -hmm. uh, and I must say it's a, a pretty volatile market. Uh, I've been for two years now the CEO of Friesland Campina and uh, I uh, discovered that uh, in three years we had, uh, well in 2007, it was just before my time, it was the highest year, um, 2008 was, uh, mm. or, and, and nine were the, the low years. So in that respect you see uh, quite some, uh, some stretch between the highest points and the lowest points. Mm. Um, I think um, the lowest point has been uh, very much influenced by a very uh, 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 big difference between uh, supply and demand, especially the demand because of the economic, uh, economic uh, crisis went down um, and that basically uh, has caused uh, the negative price effects. Uh, what we see now is picking up of uh, demand, uh, a reasonable uh, development of the supply uh, and that means that uh, we are pretty positive about the development of the prices at this mm. moment of time. So we're, we're stuck with this volatility? 
I think so, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that will be with us for years, yes. For Europe, it's a very different, uh, uh, let's say, feature. Um, mm. In the past, there was intervention by Europe, uh, by the European uh, Commission, by Brussels. Uh, that has uh, been reduced over the last couple of years and that has caused uh, quite some uh, uh, volatility in the, Euro the European prices right. as well. Right. Which I guess flows on to the rest of the, Absolutely. Of yeah. the world. Yeah. Now New Zealand tends to aim at the high end, the middle classes with dairy products in emerging markets. But what about the vast masses who simply want milk from a cow? And I think of India as a prime example of that. Do companies like Friesland, Campina and Fonterra use their expertise to set up farms in developing countries to supply those mass markets with just plain simple milk? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. um, we have brands that are basically, a Dutch lady in Vietnam for example, uh, is all about uh, bringing uh, uh, milk uh, and parts of that fresh milk uh, to the consumers. Mm. Um, we are taking it as uh, some of our uh, responsibility as well to help farmers uh, uh, to be educated uh, towards uh, uh, hiring uh, their milk production. So in fact we have now uh, appointed uh, one of our Dutch farmers, one of our members that uh, will move from the cooperative to, to the company if you like. Uh, he will move to Vietnam and is going to set up uh, uh, the, the system uh, in Vietnam uh, and help uh, the, the dairy farmers uh, to improve their, uh, the quality of work, working and as well their output, the productivity. Mm. Now you've talked about a number of challenges and particularly the dairy industry getting out of its defensive mode. What do you mean by that? What do you dairy guys have to be defensive about? Well I think um, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, the focus on milk fat, if you go to this kind of uh, conference, they're all talking about, uh, uh, let's say, the, the problems about uh, the perception of, of milk fat and how we uh, can, uh, uh, let's say, improve that. Um, I've never seen, uh, for example, in, uh, in the marketing world, people about Coca-Cola and uh, Pepsi to be so uh, inward uh, focused about mm. uh, the poor let's say, image of maybe carbonated uh, uh, drinks. They're uh, much more, let's say, outspoken about uh, the quality of the brand or the quality of the product. Mm. Um, and I think, in general, uh, milk has um, uh, much more to offer than only, let's say, uh, the, the few negatives of milk fat. Uh, there is an, a complex of uh, ingredients uh, which is in, uh, in milk uh, that supports the well-being of people. And I think that's the kind of message we should uh, get much more across and be much more self-confident about. Mm. Well, Case, thanks very much for that interview and for, for taking time out from the You're conference today to talk to me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Case. Case Tahard there, the man who runs the Dutch dairy giant Friesland Campina. Well, that's our show, but I'll be back soon with another edition of Sector Report. And remember, you can catch up with the program on our website. Catch you next time. Mm -hmm.